Okay, hi everyone. So let's move on to our next topic, which is going to be populations and uh, samples. So when it comes to research, behavioral research um, with people, something you often have to consider, something that can be very important is who participates in your study. So we might need to think carefully about um, who's gonna who's gonna do our study and how that might impact our results. And of course, um, building up to that, how are we gonna choose people to participate in our study? So when it comes to um, selecting people to do in your study, there's of course, going to be the population. Now, this is not the population as in the population of Earth or the population of the US, um, but rather it's going to be the people you want to be able to say your findings apply to. Okay. Populations are who, who do I want? Whatever my research question is whatever I'm investigating, who do I want that to apply to? Who do I want those findings to be about? Um, and this is going to depend on your research question, obviously. So if my research topic is American parents caregiving of preschool age children, then the population is going to be all three to five year old American children. And just keep in mind that the population is going to be all, all the people who you want, you want your results to apply to. So then if my research topic is American parents caregiving children attending preschool, then the population is all three to five-year-old American children in preschool. And lastly, if my research topic is divorced and remarried American parents caregiving of children attending preschool, population is going to be all three to five year old American children in preschool with divorced and remarried parents. Okay. So your population can vary quite a bit and it can be quite large or it can be smaller. Um, I mean, generally relative to your sample, it's always going to be quite large. But let's say I'm looking at some sort of memory mechanism um, or how does memory work? Well, that might apply to basically everyone or maybe everyone with a normal functioning memory. Um, something, like these something like this example here with divorce and remarried American parents care caregiving of children, that's relatively smaller. But again, it varies depending on your research question. So when it comes to answering your research question, it's obviously not going to be possible to um, include everyone from the population of interest. Okay. So and that's always the case. Well, maybe not always, but 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to be the case. There might be exceptions, but um, any kind of research study, again, no matter how, who your population is, you can't obviously run your study on every one of that population. So we can't interview every child of, uh, in the US from three to five years old, okay? If I'm interested in a memory phenomenon, I can't research everyone with a memory, obviously, that would be everyone. So that's where samples come in. Samples are going to be a subgroup of participants that do your study that you chose from the population. Okay. So if I'm interested in, again, researching three to five-year-olds, and parenting styles in the US, 
Well, I'm not going to interview all of them. I'm going to take a bunch of them, however many, um, and get them to do my study. And that's going to be my sample. As the name implies, it's a sample of the bigger population. And how you're going to select your sample is going to be known as sampling or sampling method. Okay. So, an important factor to consider, or rather this, um, this idea of sampling, depending as always, as most things do on the research question at hand, can very, can very much impact your results, specifically in terms of how generalizable they are. So obviously when we ask a research question, when we ask, um, something to do with, you know, parenting, caregiving, um, and preschool age children. An important thing to consider is how generalizable our results are. And this is going to have a lot to do with your sample. So generalizability is, as the name would suggest, um, how well can we apply the findings from the sample to the population? So obviously I wanna be able to take my finding from my study and say, hey, this is pretty representative. This can generalize to the population in question. Now, this is gonna be dictated by um, how representative your sample is. So for example, um, if I looked at parenting styles, caregiving styles, um, and my sample was not representative of the population, it's not going to be, the results are not going to be very generalizable. For example, let's say, um, again, I'm looking at, or my population of interest is all three to five year olds in the U.S. in preschool. Well, if I were to take um, a sample that is on kind of the higher end of socioeconomic status, or maybe is has limited numbers of ethnicities, it's not very representative, right? It's gonna be missing um, groups that I wanna be able to apply my results to. And this has a lot to do with external validity more than internal validity. So remember, internal validity is how sound is the study, um, and in terms of does it have confounds, stuff like that? Is the manipulation good? External validity is, does it actually apply to the question, the kind of real world um, behavior in question? Well, again, if, if our sample is not representative, if it doesn't kind of reflect what it's meant to reflect, then it's not externally valid. So here's what this kind of looks like um, visually. If you have a population like this, and this is whatever this characteristic, whatever this population is that you're interested in studying, and you select sample, well, the sample should be a smaller mirror of the population, right? So there could be a lot of, a lot of traits that are important that you wanna be able to be a representative of. This again, depends on your research question, but we'll kind of just use things like, say, gender, um, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, because those are kind of good, simple examples. So if my population of interest has a mix of children and adults, various ages, uh, both men and women, well, my sample should, should basically reflect that, right? So if I have, you know, let's look at that. Let's say not too many children in the population of interest. Well, then my sample should have not too many children. Um, let's say the population is more, it's not in this example, but it's more men than women. Well, then my sample should be more men than women. 
um, so on and so forth. Uh, if you know the sample has a lot of different ethnicities, well then, or sorry, if the uh, population has many ethnicities, then so should the so should the sample. And it's also important we want to try to match it up with what's want to try to match up what's in the sample with what's in the population. And we're going to go to, into this in more detail, how we actually accomplish this. Well, let's say the population of interest is, you know, 20% African American. Well, then we want our, we want our sample to be about 20% African American, so on. So, and same for other ethnicities. If our population is, I don't know, I'm just throwing out numbers here, but 10% Asian, then we want our sample to be about 10% Asian. That's what we mean by representative, because it reflects, it's representative, sample is representative and reflects the characteristics of the population. Okay. Um, just an important note to be clear on is that size and generalizability are not the same. Okay. So you can have a sample that's large. And, and by the way, these two things might correlate. We'll get into that. But just to be clear, they're not exactly the same thing. You can have a sample that's very large without being generalizable. And you can have a sample that's relatively small, but is still pretty generalizable. So this one here, it's pretty small. It's only got like 10 people or so, 11 people, I think. But it's pretty representative. Whereas you could have say 5,000 college students, um, let's say they're all, all women, they're all you know, age, well, this would be typical college, um, like 18 to 22, that's not very representative, right? Because they're all the same demographic. They're all college students, they're all women, they're probably pretty, doing pretty well economically, um, so on and so forth. But there are 5,000 of them. Right. In contrast, we could have 100 people just completely randomly drawn from the population of interest. It's a much smaller sample, but because they're randomly selected, it's going to be much more representative. So just keep that in mind that these two things are not identical. Um, a sample can be, like we said, representative, even if it's a bit smaller, or it can be larger, but not representative. Okay. So in terms of representativeness, we kind of split our general sampling methods into two ways. One being a probability sample and the other being a convenience sample. So probability sample is going to be whenever choosing an individual in the population is known and it's going to be So basically you're gonna, you know, if you have, again, um, you have a population that's 20% African-American. Well, the probability of choosing an African-American for your study should be 20%, right? So you kind of know what the, what the spread of, of the population is and the probability of choosing those, pe you know, choosing people, um, should be based on kind of the spread of, of your population of interest. A convenience sample is when you don't know what the probability is are, or the distribution is, um, and selecting them is not random and it's not easy. It might also mean that not all members of the population are considered for participation. So typically when we do things like surveys, we often tend to use probability samples. When we tend to do laboratory research, especially in cognitive psychology, we tend to use convenient samples. So we'll go through lots of examples on this stuff, but just to give you one here, if I'm looking at a probability sample and I say randomly dial people, just all of, I say my population is everyone in the US, 
well, if I just randomly file people, then I'm dealing with probability sample. On the other hand, if I'm looking at running some sort of memory test and I'm using undergrad participants, so like Psych 100 students that have to complete experiments for their research credit, well, that's going to be a convenient sample. And in that situation, it's still the case that maybe my population of interest is everyone in the US or even everyone with a memory. Well, the convenience sample there is not really representative. It's just, as the name would imply, convenient. We're just taking whoever we can get to do the study. It's not, e it's not an equal probability of choosing different demographics from the population. And with a convenience sample, we're going to be okay with it. So before we look at the specific techniques we can use, um, think about this for a sec. So when it comes to probability samples, so that's where, again, we are really concerned with, is the sample going to be representative of the population because we're using some technique that's going to make it so, make it so that, that, so that that's the case. Well, that becomes very important uh, whenever you're dealing with the following. If you're dealing with opinions, something like politics, attitudes, anything descriptive or anything frequency related. Okay, so just I'll give you a second to jot those down if you want, or you can pause the video. And then we'll go through each of these and why, why probability sampling is necessary here. So why we want it to be like this. Well, for something like an opinion, so let's say I'm just asking people, you know, what do you think about, um, what do you think about climate change, just, just as an example? Um, that's something that could very much vary depending on who you ask, right? Um, let's say you ask people, you wanted to know what are people's opinions of of the Second Amendment, of, of gun control, whatever it might be. Well, that's something that could vary quite a bit depending on who you ask, right? depending on um, the, the uh, demographics you select. So if you ask people, let's say California, who are more liberal, you're probably going to get a very different, um, different result than if you ask people, say, Texas, right? So when you're looking to establish something like that, where again, you have reason to expect that it could vary a lot depending on who you ask. Well, that's where your sample needs to be representative because again, it could vary a lot depending on who you ask. Um, kind of really the same thing there is something like say politics. Again, it's gonna vary a lot depending on who you ask. So your sample needs to be pretty representative of the population. Um, Another one would be attitudes. So, well, these are kind of similar, but, you know, what is your attitudes towards this issue? If you could expect it, if you have reason to expect that it's going to vary depending on who you ask or, demo, dem, or by demographics, you know, then it's important to have a representative sample there. Um, anything descriptive or anything frequency related um, has to be representative or it's not really valid at all. So for example, um, if I wanted to know, you know how many how many Americans um, text while they drive, that would be something descriptive. It's not an experiment, it's not a relative comparison. Um, it's just a description of how many people do X. That, that'd be a frequency. Um, well, again, that's something where I'm really interested in the precise estimate there. So again, it kind of needs to be representative because I really want that exact number, relatively exact number of how many people engage in this behavior. And again, if you think about it, it's probably gonna vary depending on who you ask. So therefore it's important to have 
representative sample. Yeah, we come over to this example. Um, convenience, on the other hand, is best for when something should be generalizable and you don't really have a lot of reason to expect differences depending on who you, who you test or who you even ask, depending on the study design. So, for example, um, something like, say, perception, memory, attention, cognitive topics typically probably don't vary that much depending on um, depending on who you test. So if I'm interested in researching some sort of memory phenomenon, some sort of attention process, does it really, do you really, ex just to kind of go off a previous example, is there any reason to expect that people in Texas remember things differently than people who remember people in, say, California? Probably not, right? Probably not. And just to clarify, that's that's not like how you remember something. I, there certainly could be examples where like, how do you remember this political issue? That that could vary a lot by state. But I'm just talking about say like they study words and then they have to try to remember them to you know to get at some kind of memory process. Well, in that situation, again, can't really think of why that would differ depending on the demographic. So in a situation like that, it's probably okay to use a convenient sample. Um, we don't really expect there to be differences between who you ask. So therefore it's probably okay to just pick a, a convenient sample of undergrads who will do your experiment. Okay. Just another thing to clarify here, um, when I talked about kind of getting descriptive stats, well, then you were interested in an exact number. When it tends to be an experiment, like some of these, you don't, it doesn't matter so much because what you're mainly interested in is the relative comparison. Um, so to give one more example, let's say I was looking at driving and cell phones, not looking at um, how many people drive while using a cell phone, but act an actual experiment where I compare how many mistakes do they make in a driving simulator with cell phones versus without cell phones. Well, in that situation, um, kind of their basic score, their scores in both conditions could vary depending on who you test. Okay, let me say that again. So their baseline scores or their scores in both conditions could vary depending on who you test. Let's say, you know, I, I tested less experienced drivers, people who just got their license. Well, they might make more mistakes both with a cell phone and without a cell phone than people who are you know, more experienced drivers. That doesn't really matter though, because what we're interested again is the relative comparison. So if they make say, if the inexperienced driver makes, I don't know, just throwing numbers here, um, 10 mistakes with a cell phone and five mistakes without a cell phone but the experienced driver makes um, 15 mistakes with a cell phone and, or sorry, uh, five mistakes with a cell phone and only uh, zero mistakes without a cell phone. Well, that's okay because the relative comparison is, the relative effect is the same. And in practice, it might not work that way. But again, the main point here is just that we just, we care about the comparison, right? We care about are they making more mistakes with a cell phone than without a cell phone? And one might go from 10 to or five to 10. The other might go, other demographic might go from zero to five, but the key there is that the difference is the same. So the comparison is what matters, not the actual numbers. So that's just an example. Um, probably don't need to remember all that, but just the basic idea of how um, yes, things might vary by demographics, um, but is the result going to be the same? Are they still more likely to make mistakes with a cell phone than without? Because that might be our main question. Um, just another note there. On the other hand, if you have reason to expect that a finding could really, the actual comparison could change, then maybe your sample needs to be more representative. So 
just hypothetically, if cell phones maybe only distract, I, I can't imagine why this would be the case, but only distract people who are inexperienced drivers. Well, if, if you expect that's going to be true, then maybe you do need a representative sample because you'd want to be able to see is this, are cell phones distract just inexperienced drivers or experienced ones too? Anyways, that was kind of a long tirade, but just, um, just bear that in mind that kind of the bottom line of convenience is, okay, is, is generally okay. Um, even when, you know, when you're testing something that doesn't need to be, isn't gonna vary a lot um, depending on who you ask and maybe you don't need your sample to be representative. Okay. So now let's talk about the specific methods. Um, I'm just gonna grab a water here first. <clears throat> 